After I got married, my wife and I moved into a small house on a quiet street. It was a single floor with two bedrooms. We were planning to have children soon, so the other bedroom would be for that. Although the houses were small, the lot size was actually pretty decent, which was one of the reasons that I liked the place. There were a lot of trees and other plants around there. Also, the neighbors were really quite friendly, at first. Jack was an older guy who lived across the street from us. He was single and lived by himself. I would guess that he was at least 65 years old. Jack always dressed well, like a grandfather or maybe some kind of college professor. He usually wore a plaid dress shirt with a cardigan or a sweater vest over top, and sometimes a bow tie. He was medium height, but walked with a bit of a hunch, which made him appear shorter. Jack was a really interesting guy. He used to own part of a construction company, but he sold his interest to one of his partners and spent the next couple decades working at a used bookstore. I really admired that about him. There's more to life than money, and if you're able to, then why not do something that you love? I was in my mid-twenties at the time, so in a way, Jack was kind of like a grandfather figure to me. I looked up to him, and as time went on, we actually became really good friends. He would invite my wife and I over for dinner every now and then, and we would have him over too. It was a Friday night, and we were at Jack's house for dinner. We were having a great time as usual. Dinner was still in the oven, so I decided to go to the washroom before it was done. I excused myself from the table and walked down the hall. On my way there, I passed Jack's office and looked in. His laptop computer was open on his desk, and it was turned on. I can't explain what drew me to it, but for some reason, I couldn't help but snoop around a little. I looked over my shoulder, and when I was sure that the coast was clear, I tiptoed into his office and sat down at his desk. I immediately felt guilty, but I couldn't resist my curiosity. I started by checking his browsing history, and there wasn't really anything interesting. In fact, it was squeaky clean. This guy didn't get up to much on the internet. However, when I checked his pictures, I noticed a shot of the outside of my house. As I scrolled through them, I started seeing more and more images of my house, all taken at night. He must have had hundreds of pictures of it from different angles. What was even creepier was that in one of them, I could see the outline of my wife from behind the curtain. My eyes were fixated on the screen, and I kept scrolling. My mouth was wide open. Eventually, the images started to get closer and closer to my house. My heart sank when I saw one picture, where the camera must have been pressed right up to our window. It looked to be the middle of the night. However, the most terrifying image was still to be found. Eventually, I found a single shot of my wife and I sleeping, and the picture was taken from the end of our bed. Jack had been sneaking into our house at night all this time. With that, I had seen enough. I slammed the laptop closed and walked back to the dining room where my wife was alone with Jack. They were sitting at the table talking. My wife was blissfully unaware of who she was sitting next to. When I walked up to them, I couldn't even speak so I just grabbed my wife's hand and walked out the front door. I didn't even put on my shoes. My wife was confused, but she trusted me and followed my lead. I told her everything when we got home, and we moved into a motel that night. We sold the house as soon as we could, and never saw Jack again. This was by far the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me. There's no telling how far Jack would have gone if I didn't find those images on his computer. But thankfully, we got away when we did. I moved out of my parents' house kind of late. My family relocated to the United States from Eastern Europe when I was a baby, but my parents still have very traditional values. So it took my father some convincing before he would let me leave the house. Especially since I'm a female, he thought I should stay longer. That being said, I was 24 when I finally got my own place. I had a steady job at the time, so I was able to afford a pretty decent one-bedroom apartment, not far from my parents. It was in one of two identical buildings that stood next to each other, near a major bus terminal in our city. Each building was 20 floors, and every apartment had a balcony except the ground floor. My place was on the 14th floor, with a beautiful view of the highway. 
The balcony was decent sized with a metal and glass railing. It was connected to my next door neighbor with a concrete wall separating them. One thing that I really did like about this place was that there were no other buildings nearby, so I could go out there and not feel like people could see me. During my first week at this place, I introduced myself to some of my neighbors. Most of them were young professionals like me, and I even made a few friends early on. One of my neighbors, however, gave me a really bad feeling right from the beginning. He was right next door to me, and his name was Gary. He was probably 40 years old, maybe a little younger. Gary was around 5 foot 10 and stocky, kind of like a football player or something, except he was a little out of shape. He had a short beard and he was always wearing a backwards baseball hat. Kind of strange for a guy his age, I thought, but not a big deal. We met for the first time in the hall outside our apartments. Like I said, we were next door neighbors. I immediately got the impression that he was hitting on me, and I'm not someone who thinks that about everyone. In fact, he pretty much asked me out the first time we ever met. I turned him down but tried to be as polite as possible. The last thing I wanted was to make an enemy with this guy. We did share a wall, after all. As the weeks went on, I ran into Gary often. This is bound to happen since we live next to each other, but it seemed to happen a little too often. It was quite typical that I'd be waiting for the elevator, and Gary would just walk up next to me. Maybe a coincidence, but I came to suspect that he would hear me when I left my apartment. Then he would come out to catch me in the elevator. I know it sounds kind of paranoid, but that kind of thing does happen, and it seriously gave me the creeps. It wasn't until the next month, though, that things got really out of control. I had gone to bed early, around 9pm I think. I was fast asleep well before 10. In the middle of the night, I woke up. I was still half asleep though. I was aware of my surroundings, but not thinking straight. I couldn't explain it at the time, but I felt a presence in my bedroom, like someone was watching me. I sat up and opened my eyes and looked around the room, but it was still dark. I was fully awake at this point though. My cell phone had one of those flashlight apps, so I reached for it and turned on the light. I didn't see anything, but as soon as I turned it on, I heard a person run away and slam my front door. There was someone in my apartment. After that, I'm pretty sure that I heard Gary's door slam as well. Even without that piece of evidence, I would have thought it was him. I immediately dialed my parents and went over to their house that night. After I calmed down, I tried to think of how he got in. Although I can't be sure, my best guess is that he climbed around the wall separating our balconies and came in through the sliding glass door. I never kept that door locked because it seemed like nobody could get there anyway. Needless to say, I moved out of that place right away and back in with my parents. When I went back with my father to move my stuff out, Gary was nowhere to be seen. He must have been too afraid to show his face after what happened. I'm a female, and this happened when I was around 12. For some background, I've had this neighbor who lived a street down from me. For a couple months, he lived with his dad because he couldn't afford his own place. That was not a problem or anything. It can be tough out there. However, he started staring, peeking, and looking into windows of houses around the neighborhood. The police had been called on him multiple times, and he'd been arrested a handful of times for smaller things. While this was going on, rumors spread that he was lurking around the neighborhood, so parents became hesitant to let their kids play outside. One day, I met him face to face. I was walking home from my grandparents' house with my younger brother, who was 10. They lived a short walking distance from us. We walked and talked about how the day was going, while my mom drove home before us. We didn't want to drive in the car though, we wanted to walk instead. It was a nice day, and we enjoyed the fresh air. Once we finally turned the corner to our small cul-de-sac, we saw the man's car drive by. I whispered to my brother, that's the guy. He said, no way, really? And him being the smart 10 year old that he was, he yelled to the moving car with the windows down. Not thinking he really heard us, I gave him a stern look and told him to keep walking. Meanwhile, the man turned his car around and started to follow us. I finally noticed in disbelief and screamed run. 
We ran to my mother's arms. She was waiting for us in the garage, not noticing what happened. The man did a loop in his car in the cul-de-sac and left going the way he came. He now knew where we lived. That night we all huddled together, nervous that he was lurking around the home. He never came, as far as we knew. Two weeks later, he was arrested for doing something inappropriate to a woman at Walmart. That was a year ago, and he's now back in the neighborhood causing trouble. Many rumors have been going around about what he's up to, but I'm not sure what's true. I wish this story had a better ending, but that's where we are today. Always wondering what happened to him, and always looking over my shoulder. When I was younger, I lived in the downtown core of a large city. Anyone who has lived there knows how tiny some of the apartments are. When space is that expensive, they really do whatever they can to cram as many people as possible into the space that they have. Therefore, my apartment was so small that my bed was really right next to the door. All I had at the time was a bed and a desk. I actually worked from home, so these two things were the bare essentials. Money was tight for me at the time, so I couldn't really afford anything more than that. In total, I lived there for about five years. That's longer than most people would stay in that building. My neighbors would change frequently. Some of them were students or travelers from other countries. There were also a few families and some young professionals among them. This story, however, is about the worst neighbor that I ever had. His name was Fred, and he was about 50 years old. He was a tall guy with bad posture, so he really stood at around average height, but I imagine that if he straightened his back, he would have been at least six foot two. He had shoulder length gray hair with a bushy unkempt beard and wore a plaid button down shirt almost every day. When I first met Fred, I introduced myself and immediately got bad vibes. He just seemed really unfriendly, like simply saying hello was some kind of a huge burden on him. He wouldn't even tell me his name until I asked explicitly. I didn't worry too much about it at first. I can be pretty awkward myself in social situations, so I can understand it to some extent. But what happened next was beyond that. I was sitting at my desk, which was next to my bed, and I heard someone walk up to my door. My apartment was at the end of the hall, so it was rare for anyone to walk past. I looked up from my computer screen, curious about why anyone would be out there. Just then, someone tried to open the door. There were two or three shakes on the door handle, and one firm push. Luckily I had remembered to lock the door, and as soon as they realized it was locked, they must have given up. I sat there startled for a few seconds, staring at the door. I got up and slowly tiptoed over to it, then looked out the peephole, but the coast was clear. He must have left already, I thought. I waited for a few seconds, then quietly cracked the door open and stuck my head out and looked down the hall. I could see Fred walking away, and he was carrying an empty duffel bag. I was super creeped out by this, especially because I sleep right next to that door. I know it would not be much safer if I had an actual bedroom, but there's something chilling about the fact that that guy could be so close to me while I'm sleeping, even if he can't get in. I ended up talking to one of my neighbors about Fred, and it turned out that others had complained about him. This was not the first time he'd tried that. Apparently he would walk around and try to open people's doors, hoping they'd left them unlocked. I don't think he had much success, because everyone always locks their doors. From then on, I just tried to avoid Fred, and never confronted him or anything, but would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night, thinking I heard someone try to open my door. A few times I actually got up and looked down the hall. Other times I would just go back to sleep. I never caught him again, but I still wonder how many times he tried it while I was living there. This happened in Florida, somewhere between 2004 and 2006. I was around seven years old at the time, and my sister was a few years older than me. I'm a French-American, and I grew up overseas, so visiting my grandparents in America has always been an interesting experience. They had a neighbor who was a very old skinny man, from what I can remember, and he had a wife. We never saw her much. We would sometimes see her trimming the hedges and occasionally staring at my sister while we ran around in the backyard. 
My grandparents used to live in a different house that was only a few houses down from their current place. I remember having left a few toys in the old house, and I always wanted to go back and get them, but I never did. I remember on several occasions, the old man would try to coax me and my older sister into his house. Sometimes he would try it with us separately, and other times he would try to get us while we were together. I was just a little kid back then, but I do remember certain things in detail. There was one encounter with our neighbor that I'll never forget. One time I was playing out in the backyard, looking for lizards, a typical Florida pastime, when I saw the neighbor waving at me. I remember watching him for a bit, before trotting over to him. He seemed to be signaling to me to come into his garage. Right before I did so, my older sister appeared behind me and grabbed my hand. She told me off for almost going onto our neighbor's property. When I told her what happened, I remember she looked over at him. The old man began to say things like, Your dog is in my garage. She wandered in here. Come get her. I'll give you some candy. And stuff like that. After a few minutes of that, I had grown bored, and I just sat down on the grass. I remember my older sister leaning down a bit to speak into my ear, and she said something like this. When I say so, we run. Got it? I just nodded in return, wondering why we would need to run. As my older sister stared the man down, he soon began to start walking out of his garage. The man began to talk about candy, our dog, and other things as he approached us. I remember looking at him in a confused manner as he got closer. Seeing this, my sister whispered, Now, to me and we both got up and began to run back to the house. The man was screaming at us to come back. Once we ran inside, my older sister told my parents what happened, and they confirmed that we should never talk to the man again. Also, the dog was in the house the entire time. She was fine. Back then, I thought it was just a weird encounter, and I tossed it aside. I didn't understand the severity until much later. Several times after that, I remember the neighbor trying to get me to follow him into his house. One time, I had gone looking for golf balls, and I wandered too close to his house. This would always end with me tempting death, and waiting till he was a few seconds away from grabbing me before I darted back to my house. Either that or my older sister would come to rescue me. When I was around 9 years old in 2008, the man died. From what, I don't remember but I think it had something to do with his heart. To be honest, at the time, I didn't care at all. I was happy he was gone, so my older sister and I wouldn't get creeped on anymore. Now that I think about it all these years later, it was very creepy, but at the time, I didn't think much of it since I was so young. What I wonder about now is why he wanted my older sister and I to come into his house. Why did he lie about the dog, and what was he planning to do with us? This happened to me when I was 11. I was staying at a friend's house who we'll call Kit. Kit was one of those cool kids in school who was always getting into trouble. Looking back, I don't understand how I managed to remain friends with him for so long, because I was anything but cool. One night, I was staying over at his place on a Friday after school, and we started playing one-on-one -on -one soccer in the backyard. After playing for about 20 minutes, he asked me if I'd heard of a game called Mop. I hadn't, so he explained the way the game worked to me. You hide by the road somewhere, and when someone walks or drives past, you shout the word Mop, hoping to get some kind of reaction. I suppose the game could be known by any other name, but the word was Mop. Why? I don't know, and I didn't care to ask. I agreed to play, so we went down to his front yard and looked up and down the road to see if there was anyone heading our way. I should note that Kit's house wasn't on a main road, so only residents would be the ones going past. At the end of Kit's street, about 20 houses down was the bush, so I wasn't expecting many people to pass by. I hid behind the garbage bins that stand by the driveway fence, and Kit was hiding on the opposite side in the garden. We positioned ourselves like that so both ends of the street would be in view, and we could see anybody passing by. 
At that point, it was about 4pm, so it was still light out, which to me made the game sound like less fun. About two minutes in, a car drove by, so Kit shouted mop. Nothing happened, which was no surprise. I knew somebody driving by wouldn't be able to hear us. Not long after, a man and a woman were walking their dog, and as they were about to walk out of my side, Kit shouted mop. The man and woman stopped and looked around confused for about five seconds, then they started walking again. That was the exact reaction that I was expecting. This went on for a while, and I was really starting to get bored. I remember asking Kit if we could stop a couple times, but he basically called me a baby, and we continued playing. As I said before, Kit was a cool kid, and I just wanted to fit in, so I continued playing without complaining anymore. Eventually, I noticed a homeless man making his way over. Kit couldn't have seen him yet, so I gave him the signal that somebody was near, and he waited. As the man was getting closer, I could see that he was talking to himself, like he was arguing with someone. As he got even closer, I could see that he was at least in his 40s. He looked very dirty, with long greasy black hair. His face was covered in dirt, and I was starting to get nervous. When the man was walking past my side, I heard Kit shout something that I was not expecting. He shouted out, Dickhead. The man looked right towards the house in an instant, with a furious expression on his face. I was freaking out, because the man could have easily spotted me hiding behind the bins. The man started passing back and forth, with his eyes fixed on the house looking and muttering to himself. Eventually he started walking back the way he was heading, and once he was out of my view, I got out from behind the bins and made my way over to Kit. I was about to open my mouth and tell him how stupid it was what he did when he said something even more stupid. Let's follow him. I told him it was a terrible idea, but as an 11 year old kid just wanting to fit in, I agreed. We kept a fair distance from the man, but we followed him to the entrance of the bush. We hid behind a car and watched the man as he went into the woods. I wish I could say that we headed back right then, but Kit wanted to see where he was going, so we continued to follow. Kit went in first, and I followed close behind. I was walking as quietly as possible, but the leaves were all dry, and they crunched really loudly as I walked over them. After five minutes, Kit stopped dead in his tracks, and I heard him mutter something to himself. I walked up next to him, and just ahead behind some rocks, there was the man, crouched down, looking right at us. I didn't have time to react, because he stood up and sprinted towards us, shouting like a madman. Kit and I turned and ran screaming. I could sense the man's presence closing in on me, and I was fearing that any second he would grab me, and then that would be the end of it. Lucky for me, the man tripped and fell. I remember feeling the air move from the man's body just inches behind me. I was easily within arm's reach of him. Hearing the man fall, I slowed down. I looked back and saw him lying flat on his stomach, then he let out an angry growl. I turned and continued running. I couldn't see Kit at that point, but I could hear the crunching of leaves and branches, so I knew he was close. Eventually we got out of the bush and started running on the road back to the house. When I got back, Kit was already there, out of breath and sweating. I started to cry due to the fear that I could have been murdered. I never spoke of this story to anyone, and Kit apparently hasn't either. I haven't stayed at Kit's house since, and now being 22 years old, I do believe that I've learned a valuable lesson of respect, and that's guided me ever since. That feeling of how close the man was to grabbing me will always haunt me, and I thank my lucky stars that he didn't get his chance to grab me. The fact that I could feel the air move from behind me means that he was really close. My deepest apologies to that man, who my friend and I mistreated. At the time that this happened, I was around 12 years old, and I lived in a quiet suburb in South Carolina. I used to spend hours just walking my dog around the neighborhood, because there wasn't much else to do. Back then, we had a 70 pound basset hound named Rufus, who looked kind of like a sawed off St. Bernard. 
I was walking him around late in the afternoon in the fall, and it started to get dark. I was on the other end of the neighborhood from where my house was when I first saw a beat up rusty red pickup truck just driving around. I didn't think a whole lot of it, because it was the south, so pickup trucks were all over the place, and it didn't automatically mean anything. But as I was walking home, I saw the truck turn down a street. Then it came out the other end further down, and went back the way I came from. To give you an idea of the neighborhood, it wasn't set up like regular blocks. More like a main road, than a bunch of roads that all looped around and came back to the main one. At first I just figured the guy was lost or something, and I didn't think much of it. However, as I was getting closer to my house, and it was getting darker, I saw the truck again. Another thing about my neighborhood is that even though there are a lot of houses, everyone pretty much kept to themselves. Therefore, there wasn't really anyone outside at this time of night, even though it was still fairly early. I continued walking down the road to my house, and then I saw the truck again, this time just parked on the side, facing the road I came out of. I then turned onto the road that my house was on, and it started moving, driving slowly behind me with the lights out. If you know anything about basset hounds, they're not exactly the most threatening type of dog. They're short and stubby, like a big dash hound with big ears and goofy faces. So even though Rufus was a big dog, he wasn't great for protection. They also don't walk very fast, and tend to trip over their ears when they run. So I was stuck with him setting the pace. With Rufus weighing almost as much as I did, it was not like I could just pick him up and then start running either. There I was, walking down the dark road in a quiet neighborhood, with my slow dog and a creepy truck behind me. I knew I couldn't really run from it, and I doubted that anyone would hear if I screamed. Finally, I came up with a plan, even if it was a stupid one. When I got to one of the handful of lamp posts on the street, I stopped and turned around. Then I just stared at the truck. It stopped moving and just sat there, about 30 feet away from me. It was as if he was trying to look like he was parked or something. I stood there and stared at that truck for what felt like forever, but it was probably only two or three minutes. Finally, after a while, the truck started moving again. It turned its lights on and then turned off down another road. Then I booked it into someone's backyard and went the rest of my way home from there. I never told my mom about that creepy truck because I knew she'd freak out and probably wouldn't let me take the dogs out alone anymore. This happened a few years ago when we lived in the city. My wife and I had a place in a large building downtown. It was one of those ultra-modern places with floor-to-ceiling windows and Wi-Fi built into all of the appliances. There were many other large buildings in the area, and they were all very close together. Because of that, you could see right into several other people's places if you were looking out the window. It was kind of a creepy thing to be at home and look out the window to see a clear view of many other people just living their lives. It will come as no surprise that I like to keep the curtains closed as much as possible. We had a lot of houseplants though, so we needed to keep them open sometimes. There wasn't a lot of direct sunlight, but it was enough to keep the plants alive for the most part. After we had been there for a while, we started to get used to it, so we started leaving the curtains open more. It felt kind of claustrophobic with them closed anyway. We went about our lives for a while, and nothing much happened. One day, however, my wife came home one evening in an absolute fit. She was crying and rambling incoherently. She ran over to the window and yanked the curtains shut in a rage. I tried to calm her down, but it was absolutely futile. I could hardly understand a word she was saying. The only thing I could make out was that she keeps saying that we needed to move. I asked her why, but she just kept saying the same things over again. After a few minutes, she had settled down enough to explain what had happened. She told me that she had gotten an anonymous email with a link to a website where someone had been uploading hours and hours of video of us at home, taken through the windows. I wanted to see it, but she was reluctant. She didn't want to look again, but I had to know for sure. We turned on my laptop and opened the page. To my horror, she was right. 
One of our neighbors had been filming us at home for months. There were countless hours of us just sitting at home watching TV, making dinner, and everything else you can imagine. I slammed the laptop closed after a few minutes, then walked over to the window. I peeked through the curtains and looked over to the next building. It was not obvious from the video I'd seen exactly where the camera was placed, but I had managed to narrow it down to a section of three or four apartments. Suddenly, I saw it. The glint of a camera lens from one of our neighbor's windows. That was it. The camera was there. Now that we knew where it was, I called the police. We went to the station and filed a report on the incident, but it was of little use. The police did nothing more than tell us to keep our curtains closed. I was baffled that it didn't break the law somehow, especially because we knew who it was. I should mention that my wife is actually a public figure of sorts. I won't get too specific, but she's a politician for the municipal government where we live. Not a huge celebrity or anything, but she does get recognized from time to time. I figure she was targeted because that creep recognized her. Needless to say, we moved out of that place as soon as possible. When I was a child, I don't think I was even in kindergarten yet, I lived with my grandparents. My mom and dad separated, and my dad had a contract for work in the next town over, which wasn't too far away, so I got to see him on weekends. My uncle, who was my dad's brother, also lived at the house, so I was rarely ever left home alone at such a young age. I was taught never to answer the door for strangers if I was home alone. I grew up in a small town, and it was relatively peaceful, and everyone knew everyone's name. I remember that we had a neighbor who would visit regularly. He came to watch Hockey Night in Canada, WWF, family barbecues, and that kind of stuff. I can't remember his name, so I'll refer to him as David. David was friends with both my grandpa and my uncle. He'd drink beers with my uncle while watching hockey, and he'd help my grandpa out with the yard and work on the truck. On nights when my grandpa came back from hunting, if he caught a moose, they'd unload it from the back of my grandpa's truck into the shed. One night I was left home alone. It wasn't for very long at all. Grandma was at bingo and called grandpa for a pickup. Grandpa told me he was going to pick up grandma and asked me if I wanted to come along for the ride. I was watching cartoons, so I didn't want to go. So he told me that he'd be right back and reminded me not to unlock the door for strangers. I remember hearing the truck start up and I saw the headlights pull out of the driveway, onto the road, and then he was gone. Not even a few minutes later, I heard a knock at the door. I ran up to the front of the house and yelled, Who is it? It's David, the familiar voice said. Grandpa and Grandma aren't home right now, I said through the door. Yeah, I just saw your grandpa's truck drive away. My uncle isn't home either, I said. I know. I was speaking to him on the phone. He's at another buddy's house drinking beer. Can I come in? David replied. I'm not allowed to open the door for strangers, I told him. I'm not a stranger. I'm your neighbor. You know me. Let me in. He was right, I thought. I did know him. And he was a family friend. He literally lived next door. It didn't occur to me at the time why he would want to come and visit while my uncle and grandpa weren't home. I proceeded to unlock the door and open it for David. I remember seeing him towering over me as I looked up. He was drunk. I could tell by the way he talked and how his upper body was swaying side to side. He was squinting with one eye. He took one step in and I moved back quickly, not wanting my feet to get stepped on. He put his hands on my shoulders. There weren't any alarms going off in my head yet. I had seen my uncle drunk before. I told him to come in, and he could wait in the kitchen if he wanted, and then I was going to go back to watch TV. He wouldn't let go of my shoulders, though. I tried grabbing onto one of his hands in an attempt to free myself from his grip. It was futile. I can't remember what he was saying to me, but I just remember hearing the anger in his voice and the fear inside me after hearing him speak. 
He dragged me into the kitchen and grabbed a big knife. He asked me if I wanted to get stabbed as he poked me with the knife on my belly. I started to cry out in fear. He told me to shut up or he'd cut out my tongue or slice my throat. I remember feeling the cold steel of the knife as he used the other side of it to fake slice my throat as if to show me or prove that he wasn't kidding. The next thing I remember was hearing the sound of the truck pulling in, the engine turning off, and the doors of the truck opening and closing. I felt a moment of relief as I knew rescue was seconds away. I was just about to holler for help when he put his hand over my mouth to prevent me from screaming. He turned us both towards the door, and I remember seeing the door open and my grandma entering the house. Her smile quickly faded when she saw David was holding me hostage with a knife. She screamed for my grandpa to get the hell inside right now. My grandpa was always a big and strong man. He rushed in, and I remember hearing his booming voice. What the hell is going on in here? He looked at David, still holding me hostage. I remember that I could see the rage and hate in my grandpa's eyes as I realized the situation. His voice was still booming. What the fuck do you think you're doing? As he advanced towards David. He was in full attack mode. David pushed me to the floor, and my grandma rushed over and grabbed me so tight that I couldn't see what was happening. She was comforting me and told me that I was safe. I could still hear the commotion in the kitchen. A struggle was happening. I don't remember who was saying what. All I remember is my grandpa was victorious. I was finally able to look up as he shoved David out the door. Never come back here again, you son of a bitch. And he slammed the door shut. David knew I was home alone, and he waited for that moment when he saw my grandpa's truck pull away. He knew my uncle wasn't home, and probably asked if my grandma was at bingo that night as well. With this knowledge, and seeing my grandpa's truck drive away with only my grandpa in it, he knew it was his opportunity to do whatever he had planned. Or maybe he didn't even have a plan. I don't really know what his motives were. I was just a young boy. After my grandpa's funeral, after I was done with high school, I was sitting at the table with my grandma, exchanging stories about grandpa. I brought up this moment with my grandma, remembering the hero that he was that night. She looked a little nervous as I recalled the story. She said it was a very scary night. She asked if I remembered that he went out hunting that night. I vaguely remember, but it wasn't something that he usually did unless he was going camping or something. I asked why she told me that, but she didn't remember much. It got me thinking. They never called the cops to press charges on David, and I never saw him again after that. My grandpa was respected in the community. He was friends with as well as went to church with some of the police officers and they all knew him to be a good hunter. No one would ever question him if they saw a bloody tarp in the back of his truck while he was driving out of town late at night. During the early years of my first marriage, my then-husband Daniel and I lived in a small apartment. There were three floors in total plus a basement. The basement was a dreary and dreadful place with a serious rat and mouse problem. I had only been down there once out of curiosity. The only reason anyone else would go down there was to tend to the furnace or the fuse box. It would have been nice if they would clean the place up and put a laundry room down there, but that never happened. We used a laundromat down the street. It wasn't the most glamorous place, but it was good enough while we were getting our careers in order. Daniel was a recent graduate from the accounting program at a local community college, and he just landed his first job. It was a big step for us, even though the money wasn't great. I, on the other hand, was finishing up an internship in a physical therapy program. Dan was very calm and serious. He spoke with purpose and never minced words. He carried himself with a stoic intensity that I've never seen in anyone before or since. Once you get past his tough outer shell, though, he was a really sweet and caring guy. It's safe to say that I was head over heels for him, and he felt the same for me, so I thought anyway. Our apartment was on the second floor, and we had a few neighbors. 
most of whom we didn't even know. The other tenants on our floor kept to themselves for the most part, and they were all very quiet. The only exception was our upstairs neighbor, and they fought often. Nothing physical as far as we knew, but verbal arguments were frequent. Their names were Claude and Celia. Claude was older, 35 if I had to guess, and Celia was probably my age, which was 23. We would pass in the hall and exchange small talk now and then, but our conversations never went far below the surface. Maybe that's because I was afraid the fighting would come up, and I didn't want to get into that. We never bothered to complain about them, even though the noise was quite a nuisance. It just didn't seem like our place, although looking back, I know that we should have done something. The walls were thin enough that we could hear even light conversation, but we usually couldn't make out any actual words. It was just always muffled. It seemed like once or twice a week, we would wake up to yelling from upstairs. Because of that, we weren't alarmed when one night the shrill sound of a woman's scream pierced our ears. Daniel and I jumped up in unison from our sleeping positions in bed. I thought it was the fire alarm at first, but when I came to, I realized it was another fight from the couple upstairs. We had listened to dozens of fights by then, but this one was different. The screaming was on another level, but strangely, it seemed very one-sided. Celia was screaming, but Claude was very calm. It seemed like he was trying to defuse the situation. I could only tell that from the tone, because I couldn't understand most of the words. At one point, I almost called the police, but Daniel stopped me. It's not our place, just go back to sleep, he said calmly. How can I go back to sleep? Do you hear this? I shot back. Listen, we've heard all this before, just let it go, he added. I didn't like his tone, but I backed down reluctantly. The yelling continued for several more minutes, then we heard a loud thud and a crash on the floor like someone had just dropped a ton of bricks. After that, nothing but silence. I looked over at Daniel, and he was laying still on his back with his eyes closed. I knew he couldn't be sleeping though, so I said, Daniel, did you hear that? It stopped now, go back to sleep, he said. I was stunned by his coldness. There was no way he didn't hear what I heard. I got up out of bed and looked around the room for my phone. I couldn't let this go. Before I had a chance to call, I heard police sirens and they were getting louder. Then I heard the door of our building open and several people entered then stomped up the stairs. I figured someone else must have called, so I sat on the end of my bed and buried my head in my hands. After about 30 seconds, I looked over at Daniel, and he was just lying there, seemingly asleep. I couldn't understand how this situation didn't bother him more. I knew he heard what I heard, so how could he be so cold? My attention soon turned back upstairs. I could hear that others had entered the place upstairs, and as soon as they did, the woman's scream started again. It was Celia, and that must have meant that Claude was the one who was hurt. I also found it odd that the screaming only started again when the police or paramedics arrived, or whoever it was. I then got up and looked out the window. There was an ambulance parked in front of the building. The flashing lights were still on, and I noticed a stretcher being wheeled out to the back of the ambulance. I'll never forget what I saw on the stretcher. It was Claude, and he was badly beaten. I couldn't understand how he looked so bad. At that moment, however, I didn't know what was more disturbing, the event itself, or Daniel's indifference. To me, it was crystal clear that we had just witnessed a crime. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping in my own bed that night, so I went out to the living room and tried to sleep on the couch. I must have drifted off at some point, because I remember waking up in the morning. Daniel was sitting on the chair in front of the couch. He was looking at me, as if he was waiting for me to wake up. His legs and arms were crossed, and there was a serious look on his face. I sat up on the couch and looked at him, then he said, I don't know what you think you heard last night, but if anyone asks, we were asleep. What? I heard it all. Why would I say that? I asked. 
It's just not our place to get involved, he added. His expression was very serious and cold. I was beyond creeped out at this point. There was something going on with Daniel, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I agreed not to tell what I'd heard that night, but I couldn't understand why. I was so suspicious of Daniel that I had to dig deeper. Later that night, I decided to go through his phone. While he was in the shower after work, I took it out of his pocket. It was password protected, but I knew the code, so I entered it and started snooping. It wasn't long before I found messages between him and Celia. They were having an affair. It was all in plain sight, but I didn't see it. I moved out of the apartment immediately and stayed with my parents for a while, and we divorced soon after. I found out later that Claude died, and it was ruled an accident, but I don't believe it. I think Celia murdered him, and Daniel had something to do with it. Even though I can't prove anything, that's the only thing that makes sense. If that's true, and they conspired to kill Claude, then was I next? My name is Perry, and I grew up in the suburbs of a large city. It had a real small town feel, and I knew all my neighbors, even the ones who didn't have kids my age. I only learned later in life that that's not the norm. We would have a big party for the whole neighborhood twice every year, once for Christmas and the other in the summer. My house was on the corner of one of the main streets. There was a small wooded area on one side with a creek running through it. The wide streets were lined with large trees which were mostly oak and maple. On the other side there was a highway, which was the only thing that kind of killed the mood. The noise was never that bad though. It was the kind of place where nobody locked their doors. Everybody looked out for each other, so there was no need. One of my neighbors was Carrie, and she was older than me. I was 11 at the time, and she was probably 17, give or take a year. She and her older sister Claire used to babysit me when I was younger. We were very close for a while. She was almost like an older sister to me. I'm an only child, so I was always happy to have her in my life. She had begun some kind of rebellious phase, though. It was like she was too cool to be seen with me anymore. Her new friends were real jerks, and I think it was their influence that caused the change in her behavior. I had even overheard my parents talking about her. Rumors traveled fast back then. Like I said earlier, we have a few large parties for the whole neighborhood each year. This story takes place at the Christmas party in 2011. The party was at my next door neighbor's house, the Altwins, because they had a large open area on the main floor and a finished basement. So there was enough space for at least 40 people. I went with my parents at around 6pm. When we got there, my parents split off to socialize and I joined the other kids in the living room. They were playing Super Smash Bros on the GameCube, and I was really into that game at the time. After an hour, I got up to see what else was happening. Just then, the front door swung open and Carrie walked in. I was a little nervous around her. It was kind of an awkward feeling because we used to be so close. My young mind didn't know how to deal with it. With her was her new boyfriend Brad, who I'd seen around a few times, but I didn't like him. He seemed like your typical arrogant bully. Brad was tall, probably six foot three, and muscular. He had short brown hair and a patchy beard. Not bad for a guy his age, to be fair. As soon as they entered, I knew they were drunk. Even at 11 years old, it was obvious to me. In fact, that was probably the first time I'd ever seen somebody drunk in real life. I probably only recognized it because of movies and TV. Feeling uncomfortable, I turned away and went back to the video games. There's safety in numbers, I guess. Not long after, I heard an argument break out. Carrie was going at it with her dad, who was at the party already. He was trying to de-escalate the situation, no doubt trying to reduce the embarrassment that he must have been feeling. She was belligerent, though. Things only got worse when Brad joined in. I turned around to look at what was happening. I couldn't help myself. They were standing there in the kitchen area. It was all a big open space though, so everybody could see what was going on. Carrie's dad was trying to get them to leave, but they wouldn't go. I was shocked, however, when Brad pulled a folding knife out of his pocket 
and opened it. He didn't point it at anybody in particular, but taking it out at all was a threat in itself. Just then, Carrie's dad erupted in a fit of rage. He and Brad were screaming at each other with an intensity I'd never seen before. I'm sure he felt that Brad had corrupted his daughter, a very understandable feeling. Mrs. Altwin then yelled that she was calling the police. That must have been enough to spook them, because Carrie and Brad left immediately. Several minutes later, Mrs. Altwin came up to me and the other kids and told us that the party was over. Who could blame her? My parents and I went home, along with everyone else. The next morning, a police officer came to our door. I watched from around the corner when my father talked to him. I couldn't hear the conversation, though. After the officer left, I was too scared to ask my dad what it was all about. The truth would come out soon enough, though. For the next few days, our street was overrun with police cars. That was really strange, because we almost never saw police in our neighborhood. I was never interviewed, but some of my friends were. Rumors went around for a while, but I eventually found out by talking to friends that on the night of the party, Brad was found dead in the small wooded area near my house. I heard that the cause of death was ruled as hypothermia, but that he also had injuries that could be explained by a big fall. It's not hard to imagine that Brad could have tripped and fallen, then passed out. He was definitely drunk that night, but I can't help but wonder if something more went on after the party. Some of the more conspiracy-minded among my neighbors suspect that Carrie's dad may have had something to do with the death. This took place around 20 years ago. My wife and I lived in a quiet neighborhood with our son Matthew. We knew most of our neighbors. It was the kind of place where everybody was friendly and everyone knew everyone's business. There were also many kids in the area, some of whom were playmates of our son. There was one kid around there that caused a lot of trouble though. His name was Zach, and he was 11 years old, one year younger than my son. Zach was short for his age, but he was strong too. Not fat, but he was really thick, almost muscular. He was always getting into fights with the other neighborhood kids, but he always had an excuse. It seemed that whenever Zach was around, there was trouble. The other kids knew about him, but he was also considered one of the cool kids, so they did want to hang out with him. I guess that's how it works. Needless to say, my wife and I didn't like Zach. We were concerned about the influence he may have over Matthew. His parents didn't do anything about his bad behavior, so there wasn't a whole lot we could do. Things went way too far one day, though. Matthew came home from hanging out with his friends, and when he walked in the door of our house, a pungent smell hit me. It was the unmistakable smell of gasoline, and it was coming from my son. I looked up at him, and I could tell he was distressed. He wasn't crying, but it looked like he was close. Matthew was scared to death. He stood there in the doorway trembling as I got up from the couch. I walked over to him and put my hand on his shoulder. I felt something wet on my hand. When I smelled it, I realized Matthew was soaked from head to toe in gasoline. After he got cleaned up, we sat down in the living room and he told me what happened. Matthew and his friends were walking through the woods and they ran into Zach and some other kids. Zach had a water jug filled with gasoline, but I never found out why. I'm not sure exactly what led to it, but Zach poured the gasoline all over Matthew's head. Then he pulled out a lighter and pretended to light it. The other boys stood there in horror, but none of them did anything. Eventually, Zach let them go, and they all ran home. To me, that really crossed the line. Up until then, Zach's behavior was bad, but not far out of the ordinary. This incident made me fear for my son's life. I called Zach's parents and gave them an earful, but much like before, they didn't care. It was like they were delusional about what was going on with their son. It was so clear that there was something wrong, but they just wouldn't hear it. I didn't want to do it, but they left me with no choice. My wife and I decided to call the police. Zach was sent to a juvenile detention facility because of what he did to Matthew. And I can't remember the exact length of the time he was gone, but when he came back home, things got even worse. We would often see him hanging around outside our house. He would walk back and forth on the street in front 
looking in the window with a menacing stare. He was clearly trying to intimidate us. Matthew also told me that he'd been bragging to others at school about how he was going to kill our whole family. One of Zach's friends must have had a conscience because someone told a teacher what he was planning. The police got involved again and they searched his room at his parents' house. They found some really disturbing things. Somehow, he had gotten a hold of a gun as well as several knives. They also found a journal where Zach had written about all the things he was planning to do to my family. After that happened, Zach's family moved out of our neighborhood, and that was the last time we saw him. Fortunately, his plans were never fulfilled. I googled his name a few years ago out of curiosity, and I was able to find some news articles and other public records. It turns out that he's been in and out of prison for most of his life, various assaults and robbery charges. To be honest, I was surprised he hasn't done more. That kid was seriously troubled, and in my opinion, it's only a matter of time before he does something worse. I grew up on a farm. My dad was building the house while we were living in it, so the front door was not complete. We didn't even have a lock on the door or a doorbell. That's why we moved into a duplex in town. There were two doors in the front. The first door went seven steps down to our unit. The second door went seven steps up to the other unit. An old lady lived up there. I was around nine years old at the time. One day after school, I was outside playing in front of our door. It was the first time we actually had a lock on our door, and it was the first time we had a doorbell as well. So I would lock myself out and then ring the doorbell. My mom was home in the kitchen making dinner, which was located towards the back. My mom would come and open the door. I did this twice. I was surprised that my mom was not mad at me. I was going to lock myself out a third time, but I figured I better not. What if my mom got tired of coming out to unlock the door for me? At some point, I noticed a green car circling the block in an odd way. Given the location of where we lived in relation to the town as a whole, it made no sense for a car to be traveling in that direction. It came from the north and turned west onto our street, passed by me, then turned north. It was going in a circle. It was also moving quite fast. Sure enough, it circled again and stopped right in front of our place. This set off alarm bells in my head. In a small town, you don't park in front of someone's place unless you belong there. And anyone belonging to our place would have parked in the driveway. Two guys got out of the car. One was an older guy, probably late 30s or early 40s. The other was a young adult, or a very old teenager. The older guy had tattoos on his arms, which was very unusual back then. They both came running towards me. The minute I saw their feet touch our grass, I turned and opened our door, got inside, closed the door, locked it, and ran down the steps. I ran into my bedroom, which was at the front of our unit, and I hid under the bed. I listened very intently. If they knocked, I would hear it. If they rang our doorbell, I would hear it. If they knocked or rang the doorbell for the lady upstairs, I would hear that as well. It would not be as loud as our doorbell, but it would still be audible, and since I was listening intently, I would notice. I was under that bed for a few minutes, and I heard nothing. Finally, I worked up the courage to look outside, and they were gone. I didn't tell anyone, and I forgot about it. I never understood how two people could agree to kidnap someone, so it never made sense to me, and I dismissed it. A year later, we moved to the other side of town, into a house. One day, my dad, my mom, and I went for a drive around the small town. It was something you often did in small towns. You would casually drive around slowly. It was something to do. Anyway, my dad ended up driving past that duplex that we used to live in. He then turned onto a main road that was west of the duplex. The road ran south. Somehow, my dad turned west, and again, up onto a dirt road. I had no idea this road existed. This road was further west, and there were shacks and rundown houses on it. They were all hidden further west of the main road. I had no idea this part of town existed. We passed a shack, then another. Then at the next shack, I saw that same green car from a year ago. I was so scared 
that I hid near the floor in the car as we passed. I realize now that those people lived there, and they were likely on their way home. If they were driving on the main road to go home, then they would have seen me playing at my front door. I would have looked like I was locked out. There I was, ringing a doorbell and trying the lock. They circled my place and made their move. I bet I surprised them greatly when I simply walked inside. And they were not visiting that old lady because they never came around again and that old lady didn't have people with tattoos visiting her. My name is Robbie and I'm a 28 year old male from central England in the UK. Our house was semi-detached with a next door neighbor. There were three more semi-detached houses to the right of ours. There was a field with a park to the back of my house and a small tree situated just near our path. In March of last year, I was helping my family to construct a fence. We were using tools so we could make it very strong. It had to be strong enough to avoid damage if there was stormy weather. We have also had people try to damage our place in the past, even though we did nothing to them. Maybe somebody had been putting them up to it. Who knows? As we were constructing the fence, one of the craziest kids came up to us shouting. He asked me what I was doing, and then he said he was going to F me up. My brother and I laughed and continued. Then he walked closer on the road approaching our place. He started pulling at his pockets, and I said, Yeah? What are you going to do now? I picked up my hammer and hid it behind me just in case. With adrenaline on pause, I said, F off. Move from our place and get away. Move now. I'm not going to tell you again. I have some PTSD and possibly some mild TBI due to a vile scumbag in the past years who had thrown a brick at my head for no reason, but that would be another story. He then went to get his dad as he laughed like some sort of a pirate from a ship. He was around six foot three with a stocky build and he had a metal pole in his hand. He shouted in a rage of anger, You, you threatened my boy. Was it you? I said that I did not threaten him and I told him to clear off from my place. He and my brother then had some kind of a conversation, but I can't fully remember it. The crazy dad then said to my brother, I don't know who you were talking about passing through the place, but it certainly wasn't us. Shortly after he and my brother spoke, I tried explaining about his kid. Then he moved his big strong metal pole towards my neck. He didn't swing it fully at my neck, but he placed it there gently. I could see that psycho look in his eyes, and he said, now, if you ever threaten my boy again, then I swear, I swear, I'll cut you to pieces. I was horrified and in terror. My adrenaline had raced to 200, like a Ferrari. My brother picked up a drill and pressed the on button. When he did that, they ran away. In my panic and terror, I picked up my pizza blade from the kitchen. I started swinging it at him from my driveway and saying, who are you going to cut to pieces now? He then called us a bunch of liars. We called the cops, and they sent two armed officers with tasers and a gun. One of them tried to comfort me, and the other was talking to my mom and brother. He listened and took a full statement on body camera, and then said, Don't worry, we'll try to get to the bottom of this. I said, You need to. He's clearly a danger, and he could do it to others. The cop agreed. They sent local cops to speak to us three days after. As you may imagine, an investigation took place, but nothing happened. Maybe because they could not find out who he was. I believe he was involved with the crazies in one of those other three smaller houses, so I'm not sure why they weren't able to question them. It sounded puzzling to me. The incident made my PTSD quite a lot worse. Many thanks to the good doctors and nurses for supporting me and giving me strong anti-seizure meds when I needed them. Once we have the fence constructed all around, I plan on moving away and having a CCTV system installed. It will have remote access, so when incidents occur, I'll set it to record. My brother will probably stay to support my mom. As for crazy asylum dad, let's never ever meet for eternity. I'm Josh, and this happened to me when I was in high school 
which was around the year 2006. I grew up in a very close-knit neighborhood where everyone knew each other. I had a good group of friends. My best friend was Andrew, and I had a few other really close friends as well. There was only one elementary school there, and one high school, so all the kids went to the same school. We all got to know each other really well that way. It was the perfect place to grow up, and I loved it. That all changed when a new kid moved in a few doors down from me, though. His name was Mason, and from the moment we met, I knew there was something off about him. He never smiled, never made eye contact, and always kept to himself. I know it can be tough to be the new kid. Me and my friends were already really close, so it would have been really difficult for him to fit in socially. At first I thought he was just shy, but as time went on, I realized it was much more than that. Mason was creepy. There was something about the way he looked at you that made you feel like he was sizing you up. Like he was deciding whether or not you were worthy of his attention. That was strange, because usually when there would be a new kid, it would be the opposite. They would try really hard to be accepted. Mason didn't do that. I hardly ever heard him speak. The only time I ever heard him talk was in class when the teacher asked him something directly. I started to avoid him, but I couldn't help but be drawn to him at the same time. It was like a puzzle, and I wanted to solve it. More out of curiosity than anything else. One day, I decided to try to talk to him. I walked up to him at lunch and sat down next to him. He always sat alone. I asked him about his family and what he liked to do for fun, anything to try to get to know him, but he just stared at me, not saying a single word. It felt like I was talking to a brick wall, and after an uncomfortable silence, I got up and went back to my friends. How did it go? Andrew asked. I don't know. Something's off about that guy, I told him. We decided after that that we would just try to avoid Mason. I didn't know what was going on with him, but I sure didn't want to be on his bad side either. My friends and I figured that we should be nice, but keep our distance, and that's what we did for a while. As the days went on, strange things started to happen. Someone broke into my neighbor's house and stole some money and some other stuff. A few days after that, there was a fire in the woods down the street from the school. It was clearly started intentionally, because there were never any natural forest fires in the area. We all thought that Mason was behind it, but the teachers and parents wouldn't say it out loud. They saw Mason as a troubled young man who was having trouble fitting in, and they didn't want to add to his misery. My friends and I knew better though, and we wanted to get to the bottom of it, so we tried searching on the internet for news articles or something. Unfortunately, since it was 2006, the internet was not what it is now, and there really wasn't anything to be found. One night, however, I was walking home from a friend's house when I heard a noise coming from the woods. It sounded like Mason talking to someone. It was strange because he almost never talked. I followed it and came across Mason. He was pacing back and forth in the woods, talking to himself. I had no idea what he was saying, though. It was pure nonsense. I hid behind a tree so he wouldn't see me, and I watched a little longer. When I looked closer, I saw that he had a large knife in his right hand. I turned around and carefully got out of there. He didn't notice me. When I got home, I told my parents, but no one believed me. They thought I was just trying to get attention, but I knew what I saw, and I knew Mason was dangerous. Not long after, there was a fire at Mason's house in the middle of the night. Luckily. Nobody was hurt because Mason's dad was awake for some reason, and he managed to get the rest of the family to safety. The police investigated as a suspected arson, and they found out it was set intentionally. Not only that, but the smoke detectors were disabled. Mason was charged for setting the fire and attempting to kill his entire family. I never saw or heard from him again after that. It was a wake-up call for our community. Nothing like that had happened to us before. Mason's family moved away soon after. I guess the whispers and looks would be too much for them. I can't say I blame them. I tried to do some research on Mason and what happened to him since, but I couldn't find anything. Maybe that's a good sign, and he's turned his life around. I hope so anyway. I had always felt like there was something off about my neighbor. We'll call Mr. Johnson. 
He lived a few doors down when I was growing up. Mr. Johnson lived alone in the largest house on the street, and nobody really knew anything about him. He was always quiet and kept to himself, but there was something about the way he looked at me that made me feel really uneasy. I would see him in passing almost every day, but we never talked. He was about 50 years old, if I had to guess. He had short gray hair and a mustache, and he walked with a limp, but I'm not sure why. It wasn't until I was home alone one day that I discovered the true extent of his creepiness. It was a typical summer day, and I was playing video games in my room. My room was at the back of the house. When I game, I always like to tune out the rest of the world, so I closed my curtains and turned off the lights. I also have a good noise-canceling headset. Suddenly, I felt like somebody had come home. That was strange because my parents were not supposed to be home until the following day. Like I said, I couldn't hear anything, but I could feel a pair of footsteps stomping around the house. I was pretty sure someone had broken in. I paused my game and removed my headset, then listened closely, but the sound had stopped. I shrugged it off and continued playing, but after a few minutes, it started again. This time it was stronger and more persistent. I could feel each step rattle through my body. I got up to investigate. I tiptoed out of my room and cautiously walked down the stairs. I peeked carefully around each corner as I made my way to the kitchen, which is where it seemed like the noise was coming from. When I entered the kitchen, I saw that one of the cabinets was open. I was sure that I had closed it before I started playing, but there it was, wide open. I approached the cabinet, my heart racing with fear. As I reached the handle, I heard a rustling sound coming from behind me. I spun around, and there he was. Mr. Johnson was standing in my kitchen, with a blank look on his face. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, I'm pretty sure he was drunk. Mr. Johnson just stood there, silently looking at me. What are you doing in my house, Mr. Johnson? I finally managed to say, my voice trembling. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you, he said in a calm voice. Your mom called me and asked me if I could see if you're okay. There was no way that was true. I was 14 years old at the time, and I'd been left home alone more times than I could count. If my mom wanted to check on me, she would just call me on the phone. I was skeptical, but I didn't want to start a confrontation with that guy, so I told him I was fine and thanked him. He turned around and walked away, but as he was leaving, he turned around to me and said, See you soon, kid. I was left feeling rattled and disturbed. I didn't understand how he'd gotten into my house. I was sure I'd locked the door. I stayed up that entire night too scared to sleep, and when my parents got home, I told them what happened. As soon as I got halfway through the story, my dad had already called the police and reported the incident. They told me they would investigate. The police interviewed Mr. Johnson, but he denied anything happened at all. It was my word against his, so there was not much we could do. I was starting to feel like I was losing my mind. Wasn't my account evidence enough? Over the following weeks, I hardly slept a wink. Every noise and every creak shook me. I went out of my way to avoid seeing that guy, but it was hard. Around that time, my father installed a set of security cameras to help put my mind at ease. One morning, after reviewing the footage, my father called the police. Mr. Johnson was back. With that evidence, they were able to arrest him and perform a search on his house. What they found was far more disturbing than I could have imagined. Mr. Johnson had his own key to our house, as well as keys to several of our neighbor's houses. I still can't explain how he got it. He was sentenced to jail time, and I never saw him again. To this day, I still have nightmares about Mr. Johnson and the way he used to look at me. I moved out of that house as soon as I was old enough, and my parents moved shortly after. It's hard to think that things wouldn't have escalated beyond creepy. I'm sure if he wasn't stopped, then someone would have gotten hurt. It was a really close call, and by far the creepiest thing that I've ever experienced. This happened almost a decade ago, when I was in my early 20s. 
I used to visit my grandmother a few times each year, always in the summer because she lived in Minnesota and the winters were really rough. My grandmother lived in a fairly small town, and I loved the quiet, peaceful atmosphere. Her place was in an apartment complex that was made up of five buildings, which were all only two stories. They formed a square, and they faced a large courtyard in the middle, where there was a swimming pool. I always liked visiting, but during one visit, things took a dark and frightening turn. It was a beautiful day, and I was walking to the local grocery store to pick up some items for my grandmother. As I was walking, I noticed a man who lived in the apartment complex walking behind me. I'd been in town for just two days at the time, and I'd seen him around before, but not on any of my previous trips, so I figured he must be new. I tried to ignore him, but every time I turned around, he was there, always a few steps behind me. I thought I might just be too paranoid, but something about him did make me feel scared. He was walking way too close behind me. I stopped on the sidewalk and moved to the side, hoping he would pass, but he didn't. He stopped as well. I began to feel nervous and sped up to get back to my grandmother's apartment. The man continued to follow me, keeping the same distance. It didn't seem to matter how fast I walked. I was about to start running when I heard my grandmother's voice calling out. I was finally there. I turned around and saw her standing in the doorway of her apartment with a stern look on her face. The man quickly turned and walked in the opposite direction. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. My grandmother told me that she'd seen the man before, and he was known for acting strange and following people. She warned me to be careful and stay away from him. Every time I left the apartment, I felt like I was being watched, and I was sure that the man was following me. One day, I was walking to a local park when I heard someone calling my name. I turned around, and I saw that man standing a few feet away from me with a creepy smile on his face. Come with me, he said, holding out his hand. I have something to show you. I was really scared and unable to move or speak. The man stepped closer, and I could smell the stale scent of alcohol on his breath. Don't worry, he said, his voice low and menacing. I won't hurt you. I screamed and ran back to my grandmother's apartment. I told her what had happened, and she called the police. They took my statement and said they would look into it, but I never heard back from them. That man had ruined my visit to my grandmother's town, and the whole time I was there, I felt like he was after me. I left town as soon as I could, and never looked back. I never wanted to see that man again. Later that year, I was talking to my grandmother on the phone, and she told me that the man was arrested. I never asked her what he did, to be honest, I was too scared to ask, and my grandmother never told me. I'm sure you can use your imagination, though. Since his arrest, I never saw that creepy guy again, and my grandmother never talked about him again, either. I wouldn't have it any other way. I had just finished college when this happened. My girlfriend and I moved to an apartment in a new city. It was a small cozy place, with just enough space for the two of us. We were excited to start our new life together and make some new memories. I had taken a job at an insurance company. It was not my ideal work, but my student loans were larger than I care to admit, so I took the highest paying job I could find. My girlfriend hadn't found work yet, but she was looking. The building where we lived was an older one, but it had been well maintained and the neighbors were friendly. It was only five stories, but it took up a whole city block. It was like a big U-shape with a parking lot in the middle. We were on the first floor, and our view was nothing to brag about. There were other people's windows facing ours in pretty much all directions. It was like we were on display to the rest of the building. We quickly settled in and started to feel at home. But after a few weeks, I started to feel like something was off. One day when I was cooking dinner, I noticed that the blinds in the apartment across from ours were open by just a crack. I could see a small silver light coming through, almost like a camera lens or binoculars. At first, I brushed it off thinking that it was just a coincidence, 
but it happened again the next night, and the night after that. I felt like I was being too paranoid at first. It was very subtle. I really felt like somebody was spying on us. I would catch glimpses of movement from behind the blinds, and as time went on, I became convinced that there was somebody watching us through that window. I talked to my girlfriend about it, and she agreed that it was strange, and that we should do something. We decided to talk to the landlord about what was going on. We described our concerns, and asked if he knew who was living in that apartment across from us. The landlord refused to get involved, because we didn't really have any solid evidence. It was really just our feelings at the moment. One night, my girlfriend and I were staying up late watching TV. At around midnight, the blinds in that apartment across from us suddenly opened, and we could see a shadowy figure inside. It was the first time that we'd seen who was in that apartment. We stood there at the window peeking through the blinds, and eventually, the light in the other apartment turned on. We recognized the guy. I had seen him around the building, but we never really talked. He was about 30 years old with dark black hair and thick glasses. He had the kind of face where it looked like he was not even capable of smiling. And I'm not sure how else to describe it, just a constant frown. He was looking right at us, no doubt he knew we were there. The next night, my girlfriend and I were sleeping in our bedroom. Our bed was right next to the window, and we always kept the curtains shut. I woke up to the sound of tapping on the glass. I sat up in bed, my girlfriend still asleep. I slowly peeked through the curtains, and sure enough, that neighbor of ours was standing there. Dim light from the building fell upon half his face, creating a truly frightening appearance. I closed the curtains as fast as I could, and grabbed my phone. I called the police and explained what happened. They sent an officer over, but our neighbor was gone by then. We filed a report and told the landlord the next day. Terrifying as the night was, in a way it was really a relief. Until then, we felt like we were going crazy. Whenever we tried to explain what was happening, it seemed like it could be all in our head. With what happened that night, there was no doubt that that guy was a weirdo. We packed up our belongings and moved to a different part of town soon after. I still have no idea what happened to that neighbor of ours. I think he should be charged with stalking or something, but we didn't follow through with it. Our new apartment was a fresh start for us. We were grateful to be able to put that experience behind us. We made sure to pay a little extra to get a place on a higher floor. We were happy to be in our new place. It was a little more expensive, but it felt more secure, and we haven't had any problems since. I grew up in a small town in Louisiana. My parents ran a landscaping business, and we lived in a modest house on the edge of town. Our neighborhood was quiet, and I spent most of my time playing with my friends and helping my dad with his work. One of my dad's employees, Al, lived down the street from us. He was an older guy, probably in his 50s, with a scruffy gray beard and a beer gut that stretched his t-shirt to its limits. He always smelled like cigarettes and alcohol, and he had a bad habit of slurring his words. Al was never my favorite person, but my dad seemed to trust him, so I didn't question it. Besides, I didn't have to interact with him much, since I was usually at school or playing with my friends whenever he came to work. One day, though, things took a dark turn. It was a warm afternoon, early in the summer, and I had just gotten home from school. My parents weren't home yet, so I had the house to myself. I was planning to spend the afternoon playing video games and snacking on junk food, but then there was a knock on the door. I peered through the window next to the front door, and I saw Al standing there on our porch, looking disheveled and out of sorts. My parents had always warned me to be cautious about strangers, and Al definitely fit the bill. Although not technically a stranger, I thought he deserved the same treatment. But then Al spoke, and his voice was slurred and shaky. Hey there, little buddy, he said. How's it going? I didn't like the way he called me little buddy, like I was a child or a pet. But I tried to be polite. I opened the door, but looking back, 
I can't explain why. I guess I just didn't have the confidence to tell that guy to screw off. Uh, it's going okay, I said. What do you need? Al's eyes flickered around nervously, like he was trying to come up with an answer on the spot. Oh, nothing much, he said. Just wanted to say hi, and uh, maybe show you something cool. Something about the way he said show you something cool didn't sit right with me. I wanted to slam the door in his face and call my parents, but I didn't want to risk getting him angry. I don't think my parents would like that, I said, trying to sound firm but not confrontational. Al's eyes narrowed. Come on, kid, he said. Don't be a square. It'll just take a minute. I promise. I shook my head no. Sorry. I can't. Maybe another time. Al's expression darkened, and he took a step closer to me. He was standing halfway in the door. Now I couldn't even close it if I wanted to. Listen, kid, he said. I think you're going to like what I have to show you, and if you tell anyone about it, I'll make sure you regret it. My hands were shaking now, and I felt a wave of panic wash over me. I knew I had to do something. I took a deep breath and pulled out my phone, dialing my dad's number as quickly as I could. Hey dad, I said. Al's here, and he's acting weird. Can you come home? My dad's voice was calm and reassuring. Stay put, he said. I'm on my way. I hung up and looked back at Al who was now standing in the doorway, his eyes locked on me. What's going on, kid? He said, his tone shifting from menacing to almost pleading. Why are you calling your dad? I took a step back and clutched my phone tightly. You need to leave, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. Al's expression twisted into a snarl. Fine, he spat. You'll regret this. You and your whole family. He turned and stumbled down the steps, disappearing around the corner of the house. I watched him go. I was relieved, but also really scared. A few minutes later, my dad pulled into the driveway. I ran outside to meet him. My legs were wobbly with relief. What's going on? He asked. I could tell he was furious. I told him everything my words tumbling out in a rush. My dad listened patiently, and his face was growing angrier by the second. That piece of crap, he muttered. I knew he was trouble. My dad marched over to Al's house, still wearing his work clothes and carrying his heavy boots. I trailed behind him like a lost dog. Al was sitting on his porch with a beer in his hand. He looked up as we approached. He could barely sit up straight, he was so drunk. What do you want? He slurred. My dad stepped up to him, his face inches from Al's. You know damn well what I want, he growled. What the hell were you doing at my house, trying to lure my son away? Al's face went slack with surprise. I wasn't doing anything, he said, his voice rising in pitch. I just wanted to say hi. My dad didn't buy it and grabbed Al by the collar of his shirt and pulled him to his feet. You're done, he said. Fired. And if you ever come near my family again, I'll make sure the whole town knows what kind of scum you are. Al stumbled backwards, tripping over his own feet. He fell onto his porch and spilled his beer onto the ground. My dad turned on his heel and stormed back towards our house, leaving Al sputtering and cursing behind him. The whole incident really scared the crap out of me. I couldn't stop thinking about what might have happened if my dad hadn't come home when he did. What if Al had managed to grab me and pull me into his house? I don't even know what that guy was capable of. My dad tried to reassure me and told me that he would always be there to protect me and that Al was just one bad apple in a mostly good town. It was still really creepy knowing that he was living so close. For a few weeks after the incident, I didn't sleep so well. I kept imagining Al lurking around outside our house, waiting for his chance to get me. But gradually, as time passed and nothing happened, I began to relax. I still avoided Al whenever I saw him around town, 
but I didn't feel like I was in imminent danger anymore. A few years later, Al's health declined and he was moved into a care home. I never saw him again after that. A young family moved into his house and they were really nice. I never told them who Al was and what he tried to do to me. I wouldn't want to know if I was living in that house. I live in the UK, and I go by JMB. I used to live in a quiet area. It was one of those dead-end streets where there's only one way in and one way out. We had good neighbors overall, but there was one neighbor who was a real creep. He was a builder who lived three doors down. He would talk to us, which was normal, but he would also bring wine around our house for him and my mom to share. She was a single parent at the time. My mom would decline the offer whenever he proposed it. She wasn't interested in him. He would give me and my sister advent calendars for Christmas. He would also ask me things trying to get closer to us, just when my birthday was, and other stuff like that. I was young at the time, and I didn't realize how creepy he was. What still creeps me out to this day happened at a bonfire night in 2017. I was about nine at the time. Me and my sister were supposed to go to my dad's house and spend time there and see him. That was when the creep down the road asked us if we were doing anything for the bonfire night. My mom didn't see this as a red flag. She told him that me and my sister were going to my dad's. That meant that my mom would be home alone by herself. Later that day, I decided to stay with my mom instead so she wouldn't get lonely. When night came, my mom and I went to her friend's house. There were other kids my age there, and we got along well. We had fun running around and doing stuff that kids do. It was about one in the morning when me and my mom went home. We went straight to bed. I woke up to the sound of something, but I wasn't sure what it was. It was still dark outside, which made me more confused. I opened my bedroom door, and I saw a person walking through my house. At first I thought it was my mom, because I couldn't see who it was, and they didn't react to me opening the door. The layout of our house was that there was a bathroom at the top of the stairs, then my sister's room, then my mom's room, then my room at the end of the hallway. I thought it must be my mom coming back from the bathroom, and the flush of the toilet woke me. The dark figure walked into my mom's room, leaving the door open. I watched and waited, and eventually, the figure walked out of the room and downstairs. Then my mom walked out of her room and into my room and called the police. She was looking outside my window, but she didn't see anyone. The police arrived five minutes later, and there were two of them. One of them was asking questions, and the other was looking around. The policeman who was looking around said that the back door was broken, probably with something like a screwdriver. My mom said she woke up to a figure standing over her. She thought it was me, so she said my name. Then the figure walked out calmly. I think I made the right choice by staying with my mom. If she hadn't thought it was me, then something worse might have happened. After that, our creepy neighbor didn't speak to us again. I had my suspicions about him, because he was a builder and obviously had access to tools that could break a simple door lock and he had that thing for my mom in a creepy manner. He lived a few doors down, so he could have gotten away before the police arrived. Otherwise, they might have seen somebody running away. Because of that, I think it was probably him. I'm a girl, and this happened when I was 19. After my first year of college, I moved into a house off campus. I had made some friends in the dorms, and we decided to move in together. It was an old house, and it was a short bus ride to the school. It wasn't exactly the best spot for students. We weren't able to get a house super close to the school like we wanted, so many of our neighbors were families and other non-students. The house wasn't the nicest place. The paint was peeling in some spots, but it did have a cozy feel to it. We were all excited to finally have our own place to call home. We had all finished our first year, and were eager to start our second. It was a new beginning for all of us, and moving into that house was a first step towards independence. 
We spent the first few days unpacking and settling into our rooms. I was lucky enough to have the biggest room in the house, with a large window that let in plenty of natural light. My roommates and I quickly fell into a routine of going to classes, studying, and spending time together in the evenings. However, there was something that started to make me feel uneasy. A few doors down from us, there was a man who seemed to always be around. His name was Paul, and he was at least 35 years old, but he tried to act like he was our age. He would often be outside when we were coming or going from the house, and would wave and try to make small talk with us. Don't get me wrong, I'm not mad at him for being friendly, but he didn't know when to take a hint. One time, I saw him on the street, and he asked me what I was doing one evening, clearly angling to ask me out. I said I was really busy with school for the next few weeks. Most people would realize that I was not interested, but he just kept pressing while I walked. He followed me all the way up to my door and asked me on a date. I slipped in the front door and locked it behind me. I watched through the curtains after that, and he stood on our porch for a good five minutes before walking away. It was bad already, but it got even worse than that. He would stare at us for long periods of time and make inappropriate comments. We tried to avoid him as much as possible, but it seemed like he was always there, walking by our house or running into him on the street. One night, we decided to have a few friends over for a small gathering. There were eight of us there, my three roommates, two of their boyfriends, and then two of our other friends. We were all having a good time laughing and talking. We had some music going, but nothing crazy. It was a Friday night, and it was really tame. All of a sudden, we heard a knock on the door. None of us got up to answer before the door opened. We were expecting one of our other friends, so we thought it would be her. However, when I looked up, it was Paul from down the street. He showed up uninvited out of nowhere and walked right into our house. He had clearly been drinking and was trying to act cool in front of our friends. I really wanted him to leave, but I was worried he'd get angry, so I didn't tell him outright. I walked over to my friend Ryan. He was a big guy. 6'4", and he played on the rugby team at our school. I gave him a quick rundown of who the guy was, and asked him to get rid of him nicely. I thought Ryan may have been able to send the message more clearly than I could. The two of them started talking, but I could tell it wasn't going well. Ryan tried to stay calm, but Paul started yelling. Before I knew it, he pulled out a knife. Ryan jumped back and put some distance between them. One of my friends called the police, and they arrived within minutes. Paul had put the knife away before the police arrived, but we all told them what happened. He tried to pretend that nothing happened, but he was clearly drunk, and the police believed us. He was arrested and taken away that night. It was a scary wake-up call for all of us, and we realized how vulnerable we were living in that house. He was back the next day because there was not enough evidence to press charges for what he had done. We kept our doors locked and our curtains shut constantly. I even skipped class most of the time so I could avoid going out alone. I would only go out if somebody could go with me. I was really scared. But even with those precautions, Paul continued to make us feel uncomfortable. We would see him outside our house watching us, and sometimes he would even make threatening gestures. Eventually, we decided we couldn't live like that anymore. We broke our lease and found a new place to live. It was a relief to leave that house and the creepy neighbor behind. We were really disappointed that the police weren't able to do anything about that guy. I'm not sure why eight eyewitnesses wasn't enough to press charges. Paul was a really dangerous guy, and I'll not be surprised if he hurts someone else. I don't even want to find out though. I couldn't even bring myself to look it up online. Something crazy happened last year to me and my girlfriend. We moved into a new apartment together. We would be living together for the first time. It was a fresh start for us in a new city, and we were thrilled to start this new chapter of our lives. The apartment was modern, with white walls and large windows that let in plenty of natural light. Our neighbor Alex was the first person we met in the building. 
He was tall with short blonde hair and a muscular build. He seemed friendly enough and welcomed us to the building with a smile. We chatted for a few minutes and he offered to help us move our things in. We declined, but we appreciated the offer. Over the next few days, we saw Alex around our building often. He always greeted us warmly and asked us how we were settling in. Nothing beyond small talk, just standard pleasantries. He seemed like a nice guy, and we were happy to have a friendly neighbor. However, we began receiving threatening notes that were slipped under our door. They were written in a shaky handwriting, and were full of angry and violent messages, many of them with poor grammar. We were both frightened and confused. We reported the notes to the building manager, who assured us that he would look into it. We didn't suspect our neighbor Alex. In fact, we couldn't imagine who it could possibly be. The building had decent security, and it would have been hard for an outsider to come in and do that, not to mention that there would be no reason. A few days later, we received another note. This one was more explicit and threatening. It said that if we didn't leave the building, then we would regret it, among other things. We brought the new note to our building's manager, and this time he referred us to the security office. They were able to pull up some security camera footage that I didn't know about. It showed that Alex was the one putting the notes under our door. We were both shocked and frightened. We didn't know what Alex's intentions were, but we knew we had to protect ourselves. We went to the police and showed them the footage. They arrested Alex, who was charged with stalking and making threats. It turned out that he had a history of mental illness and had been off his medication for a while. He had become fixated on us and convinced himself that we were conspiring against him. He had become delusional and started sending us threatening notes to scare us away. We were relieved that Alex was no longer a threat to us and we felt true sympathy for him. We decided not to press charges when we found out about the situation. This was a mental health issue, not a criminal one. After that experience, we never felt completely safe in our apartment. We ended up moving to a different building a few months later. It was a relief to be able to start fresh again.